This is Real Generational Wealth. Live from Southern California, this is Abby, Espy, and Jen. Welcome back to Real Generational Wealth, where we have over 50 years of combined experience, making sure you and your family always have a place to call home. It has been, I think, a few weeks for us, um, so we miss all of you. Thank you all for tuning in again. Uh, If you are catching us live, be sure to hashtag live, and if you're catching us on the replay, hashtag replay. Today we have... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Today we have a jam-packed episode. We have a special guest lender who we'll bring on in a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk all about pre-approvals. It is still a great market to buy. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of topics set for you. But Yay. before we get to that, uh, Abby, SB, how are you guys? How's how's business? Still crazy? <laughs> Pretty busy. <laughs> how about how- you, SB? <laughs> Oh, we've been, uh, we've been, I've been lately working with investors. So just uh, hanging out here in the valley and getting to know the place. How fun. Yeah. 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 So here in the valley, what they call developers are people who work with investors that uh, scout for like single family home lots that are with old houses and then what they do is they renovate that and they make it into a fourplex, four units. Right. Because of the new law that they have, you can have like three units, like the ADU. So instead of putting ADU, they would put four units in a lot. You know. Wow. So, yeah. So it's like it's a alternative income, additional income for uh, yeah. for investors then. Right, so the investor would get practically an old house that has a lot of about close to 8,000 to 10,000 square feet, and then they will put a fourplex there. You can put four addresses, and each address would be like two or three story, and they can sell it for 1.2 to uh, to 1.5 million each. Nice. Nice. I mean, what I'm seeing a lot of people now, especially, you know, millennials in my age, I have, I have a ton of my friends saying, Hey, I want to get a duplex or a triplex or whatever, yeah. a fourplex so I can house hack, right? Like I can live in one unit, rent out the others and right. you know, basically get pre-approved for that. So mm-hmm. it's nice because you can mm-hmm. get the rental income from all the other units too. So, and you can still get a conventional loan. Yeah. See, or an FHA loan, right? Or an FHA loan. Exactly. Yeah. 3% down. Yeah, and you can put 75% of the income or, you know, your rent. Of the rental income, yeah. Of the rental income to be part of your qualifying income. Yeah. Nice. A lot of people don't know that, too. Yeah, yeah. So, so little tricks. Yeah, we'll, def- yeah. we'll definitely bring up more of these little hacks and tricks once we bring <laughs> um, our lender on later. But That's right, yeah. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask you, ladies, if you're noticing that there is a slight rise, I guess, in inventory. Mm-hmm. I, I'm working buyers and we're at least seeing six properties in a weekend uh-huh. as opposed to just two. You know, there's a little bit more inventory out there, um, but it's still just as crazy. It's still, I mean, properties mm-hmm. are still going above asking. Um, there's, mm-hmm. there's yeah, just I, different ways. You're going to have to become creative, you know. Mm-hmm. I think nowadays a lot of buyers are also you know, they they don't want to compete. So a lot of them are leaving the market. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's, that's what I'm noticing. Some of my buyers are like, Oh, we're just going to wait until next time when it's not so crazy or, or closer to the holidays. But I do, I do see that there is more inventory. Maybe homes are just sitting on the market yep. a little bit longer. I'm um, noticing that not everything is flying after the first weekend. Things are, yes. are lasting about a week or so. Yes, that's so true. I mean, um, I so there's also working with expireds. Yeah, you know. Oh, there's there's homes that you you're working with expired listings. Yeah, so there's more and more that are expired, or they cancel, or they withdraw. They get out get out of the market. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised. Like, um, 
so I, I took my buyers out to look at homes and our first two offers were accepted. <laughs> and it was like, well, you know, I have, and their uh, FHA buyers and, you know, we just went out a couple of times mm -hmm. and the offer was accepted right away. And then there's one where they told us, you know, we put in an offer for the home is priced at 579. So we put in an offer at 580 and they told us, oh no, the seller wants 595. And we're like, or, do you have any other offers or right. no? Right. Like it seemed like the seller was being a little bit greedy. So we we're like, okay, let's just focus on the home that they really want. This was our second choice. And that house never, it never went into escrow. So mm. sometimes when the seller is a little bit too greedy, I think it turns off buyers and they'll just move on to the next property or yeah. they'll look for alternative um, uh, properties. Uh, because it's just it gives them like a that bad feeling like oh i think you're just trying to um get you know extract more money from us and right yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean the thing is with all these sellers they're seeing their neighbors sell at a certain price when it was listed originally you know 50 grand below and they think well i can list here and get 50 grand over over that but what a lot of people miss is that the true market value of a property is what a ready and willing buyer is going to pay for it right so just because exactly. a seller wants a hundred grand more mm -hmm. than the last sale doesn't mean that's how much it's worth. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so true. <laughs> Still the economics 101, you know, supply and demand. Yeah. So now we're starting to see some kind of a turning point, you know, the market is starting to soften. There's more inventory, you know, and the uh, buyers are making some of the changes too on the, how they are deciding what to buy and how they're going to make their offers. So, you know, yeah, I am starting be. to see um, pre foreclosures in in my neighborhood, which is surprising. I'm, I'm just like, what? How? You know, I I see. I think just for Eastvale, I've seen more than twenty. Um, mm. So I think with uh, the forbearance period being over, there's the market is starting to shift a little bit. But if mm. you're still in a high demand area like the Valley. I yeah. think it'll still, there's still going to be a lot of demand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but if you're, you know, nowadays you, you don't need to go into work. So there, um, a lot of companies are seeing that um, you can, you can work remotely and still be productive. So if there's buyers out there willing to go more East or more inland, like the Inland Empire or Palmdale, they'll be able to find a home much quicker. There's less competition and you can find a newer home, much bigger. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a little bit farther out uh, from LA, but mm -hmm. it'll yeah. get you into a home. So that's, true. that's right. <laughs> well, so that being all said, I mean, clearly the market is, or at least from what we're all seeing is it's, there's a little bit of a slowdown, but it's definitely still hot. It's definitely still crazy. I mean, at the end of the day, people will always need housing, right? You people yeah. need, a, need a place yeah. to live. So and in order to still be competitive in this market, I mean, there's there's ways and tips and tricks you definitely need, you know, things you can do as a buyer to basically better your mm -hmm. odds. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Abby, do you want to introduce our special guest? <laughs> okay, so we have a special guest today. His name is Peter Zafra, and he is a mortgage loan officer. So if there's anyone out there that has questions about qualifying for a home or getting pre-approved, or if you just want to know the next steps to take in order to um, put yourself in the position of being pre-approved, definitely contact Peter. And here's Peter Zafra. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. It's nice. Hi, Peter. To nice to have you on. Thank, Thank you for having me on this hot day. <laughs> it is very hot. It is hot. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Anyways, Peter, tell us about yourself. How long have you been in lending? Um, yeah. So it's, it's it's kind of funny because I actually started as a, as an agent. Uh, got my license in 2004, and I started doing both uh, back then. Uh, actually started doing lending around mid-04, and I just fell in love with it. And so, you know, every once in a while, I'll still, you know, do a sale, but I preferably do lending. I've been doing it for so long now. So. <laughs> So that's basically how long I've been in a G about 16 years now. Yeah. I'm flying when you're having fun. <laughs> you have a lot of experience then. Um, I would like to say so. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing is, in our industry, something new always comes up, right? Like yeah. whether you're lending or an agent, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Every every buyer and seller is always a different scenario. So, yeah, yeah. it's kind of like having a computer. In six months, it's obsolete. You need to learn. <laughs> you get the new one. <laughs> That's so true. It's always something new, you know? Yes. Whether there's always something. real estate or in the lending. Yeah. Just got to keep up with it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember first time I came here in 1982, the interest rates were double digit. I, yeah, heard, I heard a lot of people telling me that, that interest <laughs> rates were like 16%. I was 18%. Like, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> but yeah. the home prices were so low. True. True. They were like 80,000, like that. So. so in the 90s, when we were refinancing, because I was also a mortgage uh, originator, you know, in the 90s. So we were you did like the opposite. Of Peter. Yeah, we were doing refinance, you know, constantly because from ten percent it became nine and a half, nine and a half became eight and a half. I was like, wow, it's low, and it became seven percent, and so it cannot be any any lower than that. And here we are. Right when I first started in mortgage, if you got a five and a quarter, you hit a yeah. touchdown. That's right. Oh, yeah, that was considered <laughs> low. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much hard money today. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a hard. That's true. That's from a hard money lender. Yeah, or like a bridge loan or something. So, um, Peter, can you tell us? Um, okay, so what's? I think a lot of our audience is wondering. Um, so, what's the difference between a pre-qualification and a pre-approval? Okay, because they're so, they're used interchangeably. So. Yes, they are, and uh, it. It's uh, actually a pretty big difference because a pre-qual is what I usually call a half approval. Um, Most of the time, it's not even half. Uh, Pre-qualification is basically a loan officer interviewing the client based on how much they make, their credit history, at most possibly pull a credit report. And so that right there, based on numbers, you know, you know, calculating manually the, the debt ratio and all that without actually looking at credit report. That's basically like a pre-qualification. Now, when you do a pre-approval, you know, when I do a pre-approval, I would get the tax returns, the W-2s, the paycheck stubs. I would actually ask them their up to four years history of residency, um, you know, uh, the place of work and uh, if they've ever owned a home. And the reason why I go up to four is because of the three-year rule of home ownership, you know, and that plays a big difference because that's where your short sales and foreclosures and such would come into play. And that's where the seasoning of time will actually kill a deal. And so that's why pre-approval is usually the best way to go. And uh, and the more information you have as to what city you want to live at and, um, you know, whether you want a condominium or a two unit, you know, mixed use SFR, that's the time to really dissect and dive into those because, of you know, and then from that point on, you run a desktop underwriting approval and then you could get a really good take on, hey, this is what they can afford. This is what they can buy. And it doesn't waste your guys' time, you know, because then you, you know exactly how much they're approved for. So you guys are not showing them six bedroom homes when they're actually you know, qualified for like three. Right. You know? So you guys or vice, versa, right? or vice versa, you know, like I tell buyers, you don't want to look at $800,000 homes if you can qualify for a million, you know, like, right. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that's, that's the biggest difference between a pre-qual and a pre-approval. And, and especially in today's market, I would say always, always go with a pre-approval. So when you guys make that uh, offer, it's solid. I mean, you you can have your pre-approval certificate. You have your DU approval, proof of funds, credit scores. I mean, the whole nine is ready to go. You know, and it and and it just makes a lot uh, the the process a lot smoother for everybody. Yeah, yeah, so that's what, true. So, what exactly do you need to get pre-approved? I can't just say, "Hey, Peter, I work at McDonald's and I make a million dollars a year and my credit score is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, What exactly do you need to get pre-approved? And how long does the process take? Okay, so uh, pre-approval, I would actually ask for everything from tax returns, W-2s, paycheck stubs, bank statements. I mean, I'm going to interview the client. I'm going to review the credit report with the client. We will run DU, desktop underwriting, based on what zip code they want to live at because all those play a part in terms of loan limits. 
for counties. I'm sure you guys have ran into those. And, um, you know, whether they're a first time home buyer, you know, whether they have, you know, okay credit, great credit, outstanding credit, all those will come into play. And that's where we look at loan types. And then uh, at that point, I get back to the realtor and be like, hey, this is where we're at. And then, you know, we go from there. So I, I actually go through the whole entire process and that usually takes up to six business days. But, is it just um, you or do you have a team that assists yeah. you? Um, yeah, basically in terms of the loan side, I do all the, you know, uh, pre-qual, pre-approved manual underwrite on my own. And then at that point, I have a couple of processors that I have um, with me and they assist in, you know, getting it through the desktop underwriting. So it's, it's rather fast. I mean, uh, we've, we've gotten some pretty hard, uh, deadlines done i mean the the, the the recent one we had we had a 10-day close and that was that was very hard nice. and uh you know so i mean um why did they need a 10-day close were they competing with cash buyers um well basically it was more like the seller so the seller was closing on her sale on a new construction oh, and she needed okay. to get out and she needed the funds from my buyer's purchase to be able to close that it, it was just oh gosh it was hectic and so and it was kind of like, it, usually that's the case. And the last one we had was an FHA 15 day escrow. And uh, I prefer not to do those. <laughs> it was difficult. Yeah, because uh, on FHA, you got to get, you got to make sure there's no paint chipping. There's no, you know, hazardous stuff. The, the appraisals uh, more strict on FHA yeah. via USDA. And uh, yeah, and then so, and the turnaround time on FHA is, you know, a little bit slower than conventional, but we got it done. But yeah, trust me, it was a, it was a lot of work. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> 20 does days it, would be perfect. <laughs> doesn't it also depend on the buyer? I mean, if the buyer has a pretty clean file, then isn't it pretty quick? Like, cause I like quick escrows. I just want to yes. move on to the next, you know, like, yes. cause um, there's more thing. there's less things that can go wrong when you have a shorter escrow. Cause right now I have a 18 day FHA and it seems like it's, you know, it's pretty, it's going pretty smoothly, but yeah, the appraisal is the one that's taking long. We already right. have the approval, but it's the appraisal that's taking forever. Right. And so, yeah, the, the appraisal is the one that could be a hiccup. Um, especially since, um, AMCs right now are very busy and yeah. so, uh, with FHA, you could be like, hey, uh, we'll assign one in 12 days. And you're like, great. And then if there's something wrong with the appraisal report, you're just like, there goes my 18-day escrow, right? right. So, mm -hmm. but yes, to, to, to answer your question, Abby, um, it's a, that's why it's very important to have everything up front so there's no surprises. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, no one, no one likes surprises oh, I don't. <laughs> during transactions it's the, it's the most but stressful whether thing. we like it or not there are times that we have to deal with it absolutely yeah, true yeah inspection yeah I mean, stuff can come out with inspection reports i've i've seen it all and usually the thicker the inspection report you're gonna have issues i yeah, mean the, right. the, the house can look beautiful but once that inspection report comes and that's like 60 plus pages mm. you know mm. <laughs> Well, it has been a practice, especially in the north, you know, um, where before they put the, the house in the market, they really fix the house. You know, you yes. fix the house, yeah. you get your section one uh, cleared, you have all these issues, you know, everything, including uh, putting all your uh, smoke alarm and how do you call it? Carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide you know, detector. detector, you know, thank, all of that. Um, once you do that, you know, then it's going to be smooth and you'll get more offers because there's going to be more buyers who would love to make an offer on a house that is all together like a move in, right. you know, all inspections done, cleared and all that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point because um, I have a listing in Roland Heights that's about to close. If If the seller didn't put any money into fixing it up, it probably would have sold sub- 800k to an investor but because they put in some work and then did what you said um yeah. sb like with the um, they put in the smoke new smoke uh detectors carbon monoxide detectors and the water heater like mm -hmm. bracing the water heater i know that's that's one of yeah. the requirements like the health and safety requirements yeah. um 
they got over a million dollars for the home, like a million thirty-five. So, yes. yeah, that one was a that one was a bit. It was a bit challenging, um, mm -hmm. but in the end, it worked out. It was much more profitable for the sellers instead of just selling the home as is and just looking for an investor, someone that has a couple hundred thousand to fix it up. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah those, those definitely play a part. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, from the audience, um, from Harry, saying, I have been seeing lately that listing agents are asking for having loan approval. How is that different and how does one get one? So I've, I've seen this too where... I mean, well, a lot of people, some people on, on my listings, they've removed loan contingency up front. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying you to work help in a you. crazy market. That's it's crazy. Crazy, yeah. So, I mean, when you say when you're getting them pre approved and running them through desktop underwriting before we even start, before the buyer starts looking, is that basically the same thing as a full loan approval? Um, I would say 98%. And because I leave the 2% uh, based on, if they go from full-time to part-time overnight on their income, because most people think once they're approved, it's a slam dunk all the way to the end. But what they don't know is before they, before they actually record, they do a soft pull mm -hmm. on the credit and they, they double check uh, the employment verification again. Yeah. And it yeah. happens usually 12 to 20 hours before recording. Mm -hmm. So those could come up. So that is why I always give that 2% because I'm a, I want to make sure it's a done deal before mm -hmm. I even say a hundred, but uh, yeah, Janet, I've had, I, I work with uh, a few other realtors and, you know, a lot of them, you know, have, have seen sellers saying, Hey, uh, leave, remove the loan contingency up front, remove the appraisal contingency. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot, remove the inspection, but you know, a lot of those inspection and appraisal uh, the lenders require, Yep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, whoever's going to fund the loan, if they're asking for an appraisal, then, mm -hmm. you know, even though you remove the contingency, you just put the EMD in danger of being lost right. from the buyer. And uh, same as you guys on your buyer, you want to protect the EMD. I want to protect the, the EMD. That's where our fiduciary obligation is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, once I send that a pre-approval, you could pretty much say it's a wrap. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because I make sure I'm a person that likes to say I double make sure mm -hmm. that it's done. And I always keep in touch. And let's say, um, for example, one of the things I do is I pre-approve the borrower and I tell them, look, from this point on, every time you get paid, every time a new bank statement comes, please email me so we can update the file. So we're not scrounging for paperwork once you get an offer accepted. Because yeah. nowadays lenders are so busy, the underwriters will not fully underwrite the file unless there's an accepted offer. Mm -hmm. And when you're missing docs, updated documents in the file, it's going to put you in the very bottom of the pile. So that's the reason why, you know, I always ask for updated. And, and it's always good to be transparent amongst each other, realtor, yeah. loan officer, and buyer. That's because, key. you know, that, that's definitely key because um, you guys are always up to date with everything. You guys are always talking and communicating and I usually create like a, a thread, an email thread plus a text thread. So we're mm -hmm. all in the loop. Right. And then whenever there's a question, a zip code change or whatnot, I can always go back and revert and make sure that we're within limits and within the parameters, that ratio is good and all that stuff. Yeah. So um, let's discuss loan limits because I ran into an issue with loan limits. Um, my clients, they... They were approved for initially they were approved for a conventional and then so we went and looked in Moreno Valley, but it turns out they're only approved for FHA and the limits for Riverside County for conventional is I think 548 to 50. Yes. Right. And Correct. the home that we were going to offer on is uh, was about 540. Um, but FHA is only 477. Yes. So they only had a certain amount, you know, like. Um, less than 50,000. So we had to start from scratch. We're like, okay, let's oh, not. <laughs> so we ended up not looking in Moreno Valley anymore. We're like, let's find something in LA County um, since the limits are higher in LA County. Mm -hmm. so right. guess, before we go into loan, I'm just so for our viewers, like, um, what what is the difference, Peter? Maybe you can, well, you should explain it. The difference between FHA and conventional, because I know Abby was kind of 
I don't want, I, I'm sure our buyers are like, yeah, oh. yeah, we're, we're saying all these initials and uh, <laughs> you have to make sure that they know what EMD is and all that. My yeah. bad. <laughs> so let, let's talk about the different types of loans, right? So mm -hmm. go ahead, Peter, FHA okay. and conventional. Okay. So FHA is also known as, as with everybody, first time home buyers loan. It's right. not. It's, it's not. not. It's not. not right? I don't know why people not. call it that. <laughs> yeah. The initial, I guess the acronym. Yeah, right. Um, but what I always tell people is this. Look, what I do, uh, and just, just as an FYI, that everybody should always ask their LO or their banker, whoever's going to work on their file, look at all the different loans that are available for them and see which mm -hmm. one's most beneficial. And, and, and the way I look at it, anything below a 620 should definitely be an FHA loan. And when I say 620, I mean 625. Right. Um, the only, see, the thing is with FHA, it's it's going to cost you more in the end because you have the, the mm -hmm. premium that you have to pay, which is 1.75. And then mm -hmm. you have the PMI, whether it's 0.85 or 0 0.80, depending on your down payment, um, is what's going to be uh, added to your payments. Plus you that, that PMI is for the life of the loan until you either refi out of it or you sell your property. So it's for the life of the loan. And these are things that need to get thoroughly explained. Um, and then another thing with FHA is that if you have two qualifying buyers, husband and wife, okay, you would need to add both debts on the loan, even if it's just the husband that you want to qualify or whether if it's the wife that you want to qualify based on FICO scores. Mm -hmm. And that goes for any government loan. So, so FHA has a little bit more strenuous underwriting and plus FHA's appraisal takes a little bit longer. So those are the things that, that, that differentiates the two. And uh, I always try to go conventional route. It's the cheapest way. The MI, the mortgage insurance on the conventional is a little bit lower, especially on high FICO borrowers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could go up to as low as 3% down instead of 3.5% down in FHA. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things and I go into detail with that with the borrower and I meant I make sure they pencil it so they totally understand the difference between the two because everyone thinks that I'm a first time home buyer. I'm going to go at FHA, yeah. but no, that's not the case. And then guess what? If you haven't owned a home in at least three years, you're considered a first time home buyer anyway. Right. So Pete, oh, Peter, I keep on saying Pete. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter. Uh, there are conventional loans that are that can also do three percent, right? Yes, that's right. So you yeah. don't have to deal with that one point seven five. No, you don't. In doing the conventional, so why why should I not do conventional then instead of FHA? Okay, um, like basically with a uh, conventional, the sweet spot on the credit score is usually six sixty and above. 680 preferably would be prime. Okay. If you have a borrower that has a, even a 640 credit, although the rate on the conventional is low, they may not qualify for a 3% down because the debt ratio ceiling is lower on a 3% down rather than a 5 plus. The MI factor is going to be much higher. It might even be higher than an FHA MI. So those are things that when we plug in and we pre-approve the borrower, we're going to look at both loans and we're going to see and compare apples to apples and see which one's definitely beneficial. And the reason why FHA wins and the low FICO borrowers is because their debt ceiling, their DTI limits on an FHA is much higher. It get, I've seen it as high as giving. Yes. Yeah. And that's, but that's the reason why it also costs more that 1.75 premium that you have to pay up front gets added on to your loan amount on right. your base loan amount. And, and so that's why. It's an FHA also for giving when you have things on your credit, like such as a short sale and foreclosure um, um, or bankruptcy. It's going to be a shorter time to wait, you know, mm -hmm. so it's a case by case basis. And uh, one other thing I wanted to point out uh, with the, foreclosure if you guys ever run into a buyer and this goes for any audience too if you have a foreclosure on a short or a short sale in your on your credit you got to make sure it's being reported correctly because if it's a short sale i mean if it's a short sale and they report as a foreclosure that's gonna make your duration of waiting time a lot a lot longer and also what caused the foreclosure 
because there there could be extenuating circumstances like a loss of a job, sickness, mm -hmm. or something like that that could shorten your wait. So those things, that's why transparency is key. So it could really be a game changer because, um, you know, I, I've ran into them a couple of times in the past where, you know, it's not so common, but it, it, it is out there where, hey, that was actually a short sale. Why is it showing as a foreclosure? And uh, the desktop underwriting software will kick that out. So it's it's that's why it's crucial to be very transparent from the get go. Okay. So that's the bottom line, you know, um, for our audience who are listening you know, if you know anybody who wants to buy, the most important thing that you have to deal with first when you want to buy a house and you start looking for a house, whether you're looking at Zillow or anywhere, is to check the credit. Yeah, It's important because sometimes we are so complacent and said, oh, my FICO is like this, my FICO is like But, you know, there are always certain things that you need to look at in your credit. Yes, right? very and, important. Yeah, so sometimes it can take you a long time to get that uh, uh, misreporting corrected. Right. You know? Right. And yeah. then not only that, um, I always ask them, did you recently buy a car? Did you yes. recently uh, refinance your student loan? The reason why is because if they buy a car today, today's like the end of July, uh -huh. that might not show up on their credit report till September. Right. right. That could be a deal breaker right there. It's like, oh, it didn't show up on my credit report. I'm not going to tell my lender. And next, you know, we do a soft pull and boom, that now they exceed the threshold. Mm. Now we need to convert from conventional to FHA, mm. you know, and it's, it's, it gets really uh, crucial to, to just tell the truth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, be transparent and it'll make the, the, the process so much easier for everyone, including the buyer. You know, you want it to be a, a non-stressful shopping for a home. Right. And right. then, uh, yeah a lot of buyers are ashamed or they think they're gonna be judged and i i just tell them you know i'm not here to judge you i'm just here to look at your situation and see what you'll get approved for like i'm just here to look at the pre-approval i'm not here to be like oh wow you make so much money or oh you don't make enough money it's just okay we just need to see what you're approved for and um just go from there mm -hmm. right and I think a lot of buyers also confuse, you know, like when we say so FICO, right? We're talking about how you have a minimum FICO score. You know, I've, I've had buyers say, oh, well, my credit karma says that I have X amount, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever the score is. And, and for those viewers who are watching, there are three bureaus and lenders, which I'm sure Peter can confirm, they take the mid score. So if you have a, a 600, a 620 and a 640, they're going to look at the 620, right? You're Correct. not getting an average of both, all three. And if there's two or more borrowers, you're not going to get an average of everybody's. It's it's the one who has the, the lowest or yeah, the worst credit. Yeah. Card. And, and that's where it gets tricky because they go, oh, well, you know what? My wife can be on the loan. And all of a sudden they don't qualify for conventional. Then you have to be FHA and be like, well, we have to put your debt load with hers. Mm -hmm. because of government loans. You guys are one person in terms of debt load. You can use your FICO. But you, but you gotta adapt. You, you gotta, you, you basically get her debts with yours, and then we're only using your income. You know, so it, it gets it gets tricky in that sense. Um, they are more forgiving. I mean, they allow a higher debt ratio, but you know, keep in mind it's it could be a deal breaker when you know the borrower wants to, you know, hide certain debts, but then they're going through a conventional. I mean, a, a government program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it could definitely be a game, game changer on that big game changer. So those are things to look out for. The ones that I've run into a couple of times is like a tax lien um, mm. uh, that the buyer didn't mention. Um, then they have like pay they have these payments that are over a thousand dollars a month. Um, does the lender take that into consideration when calculating the DTI or the debt to income ratio? Um, can you be more specific on the tax lien? Is it on a Let's current? Let's say property? there's an IRS IRS lien, um, or they they have to pay the IRS. Um, they're on a payment plan with the IRS for like a thousand dollars a month. Okay, if it's on the credit report, it's going to be counted as a debt. But what if it's not on the credit report? Um, it's just something I, that came up later in the transaction. Or... That one would be when they run a fraud report on the borrower because yeah. every borrower gets run a fraud report. If it shows mm -hmm. up there, they're going to add it on the debts. 
-hmm. Okay, and it's the, is it the title company that's doing that, the lender's title insurance company that's running that? Yeah, it's it's the title company. Okay. It used to be a statement of information, but now they call it fraud report. So they, yeah. they oh, make sure that- fraud yeah. report now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because- Right, because there's some that have uh, business loans in their name and that doesn't show up on a consumer credit report. Mm -hmm. and that can pop on the fraud report and the underwriter can uh, make a decision on that and get another underwriter involved. And then, yeah, it comes. That's why it's it's very important. I, I ask everything up front. I mean, they go, man, yeah, good to know. <laughs> it's, a, it's really good to know because that's going to take you from a three car garage to a two car garage, you know? Right. Yeah. So you just mentioned something right now, how you said a borrower may have business loans that don't show up on their personal loans. Like let's say they have an LLC, you know, and that they have a business loan. What about business credit? Cause I know business credit cards don't show up on personal credit. Is that used against a borrower? Okay. Um, if it's on an LLC and the credit card is under the LLC's EIN number, then it doesn't hit them. Got it. But they, depending on how much of the business they own, when they look at the schedule K and the 1040s, yeah. That's how they're going to base the income calculation from right. that. Yeah. So, but yeah, in, to, to answer that part, no, they, they won't hit the business credit unless they're a guarantor or a signatory or they co-signed under their name because that will show. Got it. Mm -hmm. And That's when you the reason why that... it's always the credit that is important to really check. Yeah. 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 So um, when you guys run the credit, what uh, Jen mentioned earlier with Credit Karma versus when you run the credit, I'm noticing it's much lower when it's a lender running the credit mm -hmm. than when you look at it online on Credit, credit Karma, Karma yeah. or on from your credit card uh, company. So I just want to let buyers know, like, what's the difference? Why is it lower when or typically lower when the lender is the one running the credit? Well, the reason why is because they use the tri-merge, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, and that's where the whole credit rating happens, uh, gets calculated and taken into consideration. When they're running Credit Karma, it's using Credit Karma's, you know, they're using a different software in terms of true calculation because it can either be only Experian, it can only mm -hmm. be Equifax, or it can only be TransUnion. But it's and, and even then it's only partial of what because you got to remember each creditor reports every 45 days, every 45 calendar days. So when they run their credit karma, we don't know exactly how old that is, if it's real time or whatnot. And then when we run a tri merge credit report, it could be that, like I said earlier, like if they got something like a car or whatnot, it may not show there yet, but it could be showing on their credit karma because it just so happens that that Tesla or Mercedes that they bought is under TransUnion and it's reporting a TransUnion with Credit Karma. So it's right. always good to run a, um, a tri-merge because that's the one that all lenders use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It's good so to get an idea with Credit Karma, but I usually, you know, try to knock it down like 15 points. But then even then you're still shooting in the dark because what if that's the low score, not the mid score? Or right. what if that's the high score, not the low score? So it could, it's a it's a game changer. I mean, I've seen credit reports where TransUnion is reporting at 740 and then their middle score is a 670. Ooh, so that's that's, that's a huge difference. difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge difference. <laughs> right. So so that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a question for you, Peter. Sure. Uh, I'm noticing that there are some lenders now who are starting to come up with alternative documentation. Because for the last at least 10 years, since we have the downturn, we have been always doing the full docs. Right. So right now, there's more and more creative financing that's coming out again. Or yeah. Or you can go 20, you know, down payment, you know, 100% financing. So what's up with that one? Can you uh, give us a little bit of taste of that? Yeah, there's actually a lot of loan programs that have come out now, um, which is what we call, we used to call subprime. Uh -huh. And they call it alternate docs. But, you know, of course, uh, every, I look at it as every borrower deserves a thorough look at everything. And, of course, we want to save them the most. So we, we I still try to get full docs. But mm -hmm. on the obvious side, like let's say they're a business owner and, mm -hmm. you know, they only – report yeah i mean let's say their true numbers are two hundred thousand a year but they're only reporting thirty six thousand a year because of tax purposes 
Right. Um, we have lenders that do bank statements and they base their credit, I mean, their income on deposits. But of mm -hmm. course, the least you show the bank, the more they charge you. Right. Um, so, so the more points get charged, the, the, the credit rate, I mean, the rate, the interest rate is much higher. Mm. And, uh, yeah, but they're they're definitely available out there. We already have hundred percent financing. We have DSCR loans for non owner occupied. What is they, that? What kind DSCR, of loan is that? It's a basically um, it's based on the rental income of the area, and the oh. lender bases the income on that. So there's really no debt ratio for your borrower. You know so they do require. Mm -hmm. And then I'm in Santa Monica. I have two vacant uh, units in the complex. Okay, so there's only one tenant. Now you, with that kind of program, can use the whatever is the market value on the rental for those three, two other empty units. Is that um, they, yeah, they would use the the rent rolls of the area, but mm -hmm. if it's vacant, they might not count those units. So it all depends on every person's, person's circumstance because um, a DSCR loan is a, it's an investment property. And so right. basically they're going to base it on the tenant living there. And then they're going to look at like the rent rolls of the area in general. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So they could qualify them that way. How much, but, is, um, how much is needed for, a, how much down payment is needed for this DSCR? The CR. DSCR, a um, minimum of 10%, I believe, but most of them want like a 20% down. Got it. You know, but but it's like it's like what SB is saying, they're getting more and more lenient because of the, the way the market is shifting. And, you know, basically you're going to see more and more of the arms being pushed out. And they're not so bad, to be honest with you. But again, that's that's another topic that we could look into. You know, it all depends on where the, the buyer or your client's uh, – standpoint is of where you know how long they're going to be at the property and whatnot and right. you know we just want to save them the most money of can course. you tell us what an arm is i think some of the buyers are like what are you talking about <laughs> oh, yeah. Arm, a leg? Yeah. yeah it's been a long time since you yeah. talk about arm <laughs> so an arm stands for adjustable rate mortgage and so they have three years five years seven years ten year arms and so basically since they're lending you uh money for a shorter period of time the rates are much lower mm -hmm. so you're gonna have like a fixed rate of let's say two and a half percent for five years but after five years it becomes an adjustable loan so you could be paying a five-year fixed but then uh, uh, entering your sixth year it's going to become an adjustable rate mortgage and depending on where the market is where the rates are at that time that could be your margin of addition to that rate right so, if so is it still a uh, prime plus two and a half? Is it still uh, in most cases? Yeah, yeah. They, they, it's it's basically that. But um, you know, whatever. Like I said, if let's see, five years from now, the rates dro drop a little lower, which is you know practically wishful thinking at this point. Then you know yeah, it can yeah. have a very minute adjustment. But usually, they will tell you up front, like okay, for on your sixth year, you're gonna have an adjustment of X amount because they also don't want a payment shock on the borrower. Because right. that's how America got in trouble 12, 15 mm -hmm. years ago, right? right. And so yeah. they're very transparent with that now. And again, it it can get very, uh, it, it could be a very promising loan for a borrower, especially if they plan on upgrading within the next three to five years. Because it doesn't make sense to go in a 30-year fixed where they could save five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 in a span of three to five years yeah. and if they're going to move anyway. So those things, you know, it, it all goes back to the interview process. Is this your forever home? Is this your short-term loan? Um, is this is this something that you're just gonna stay at until your parent, uh, until your children go to college, and then you guys downsize? You know, it it all depends on the circumstances. But yes, our adjustable rate mortgages can be very, very powerful for the borrower, and it can also be very bad for a borrower so you know again they have you just have to be careful and take caution when taking it i think it just depends on their situation like we yeah. i like doing arms like we like we like doing um adjustable rate mortgages because like for for that me and my husband we plan on refinancing into a 15 year so we did a 7-1 and um you know we 
we're probably going to refinance in um, in a few years, but we wanted to we didn't want to do a thirty year. We wanted it we wanted it to be paid off. So we did a seven one, and before oh, it adjusts, we plan to um, do go into a fifteen or a ten year mortgage just to cut off the years um, or the duration of the loan. So that could be the reason too why some people do an adjustable rate mortgage, and um, doing that, some of the benefits were we had all our closing costs paid, like. 12,000 in closing costs paid. And the rate was like a percentage, um, like 1% yeah. lower. Yes. So, yes. so it, it works out. Like I, I like, I like it because I understand how the loan works, but I think for some people, they don't know, like they don't right. understand the details or the implications at an adjustable rate mortgage. Um, yeah. would have so some of them are scared of it they're like oh that's how our country got in trouble but if you really understand it it's not that bad yeah yeah it could be very powerful believe it or not i'm, I'm not sure if you guys remember the pick a pay loan mm -hmm. those those mm -hmm. pick a pay loans they otherwise known as neg ams oh yeah. yeah yeah i still have one client that has that same loan today <laughs> 2006 and it's because he, he's a business owner and he does HVAC. So you can figure in the summer, his, his income is really high in the winter, mm -hmm. not so much. And, and he's been utilizing that and just, you know, making it work for him. So yes, wow. explanation is key. That's the reason mm -hmm. why transparency is key in both, in all parties actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and it can become a very powerful tool. So yeah, Abby too, with, with what your guys' plan on that seven year, if you're going to convert to a 15, it's kind of like, okay, why am I going to pay a 30? Because all of your interest is up front on a 30 year fixed, right? Yeah. And your break even is your 15 years. So, you know, those are things that, you know, people tend to not be explained properly. Mm -hmm. And that's why they get the wrong information. And then of course it becomes a negative type of loan for them. Yeah. You know, because they don't understand. Right. See all this refi craze that we have, you know, some people don't really understand that, you know, our amortization, the upfront payments that you've been making for the next, for the first five, 10 years are mostly interest. So yeah. every time that you refi, you go back to 30 years, you go back to 30 years. So whatever you make payments on the first five, one, two years, five years, they're all interest, you know? Yeah. So you keep on going back to that, you know, to, to, if you're going to a stairway, you go to step one again. Yep. You know? <laughs> right. And, and one other thing, if, if I could add on to that, Abby, a lot of people, they, um, cause they've approached me also in a 15 year rather than a 30. Mm -hmm. And you guys know a 15 year loan, of course, is going to yield a higher mortgage payment, right? Right. Yeah. A 30 year loan, although the rate is a little higher, if your true goal is to pay off your home in 15 years, we can That's actually plug it into a spreadsheet and turn your 30 year fix into an amortization of 15 years. And you're going to yield the same, if not a lower interest rate, because remember, it's simple interest, not not compounding. So mm -hmm. they can only charge you on your balance. They can only charge you interest on your balance. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it could be it could be a very powerful tool, especially, you know, um, you know, uh, borrowers that have a higher debt load, you know, they always want to go to for a 15 year fix because they want to save as much money on interest as they can. The rates are much lower, but yes. again, you can always make a 15 year payment on your 30 year fix and yield the same interest rate. And we could put that all in a spreadsheet and you'll see it because I always tell people math don't lie. Math never lies. Once you plug that in the spreadsheet, everything's in there and you're mm -hmm. going to see it. And, uh, you know, and, and it's been a powerful tool for a lot of the borrowers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a cost. And every time that you refi, there is a cost there. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want, if you know, you could always roll all the cost and, you know, you know, pay no, no closing costs and stuff. But remember, you take that by getting a higher rate so you can get a lender credit. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there, there's a give or take in everything. So a, a, a thorough explanation is definitely, definitely needed. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. Peter, we have a question here that came up from the audience. Um, I know we're, we're getting ready to wrap up here. Um, so just wanted to bring this one up. We have Mary asking, how are rates looking? And do you foresee them to stay low for some time? Okay, so I wish I had a crystal ball. 
<laughs> but the best way to look at that is watch the feds. And the last time the feds met up, they said, I mean, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but they said they're going to keep it relatively where it's mm -hmm. at until 2023. Mm -hmm. So yeah. does that mean it's they're going to keep their word? I don't know, but mm -hmm. you know, track the stock market and the 10 year treasury yield. And you guys could Google that at any time because mortgage rates usually follow the trend of the 10 year yield, the 10 year bond. And whenever you see that thing trickle up, that's when you're going to see a change in rate. And that's how usually I track it because I also track the stock market. And from there, I, I can kind of gauge where the rates are going to be that day. But to answer that question, about 10 days ago, it dipped a little bit lower than where it's been practically all year. But as of today, it's it's kind of reset it back. back. And usually towards the end of the week is when the rates kind of trickle up a little bit. But it, in today's market, it's not really the rates. It's more like the cost to the rate. You know, because uh -huh. you this, the 2.75s, the 2.625s, they're still available. But there's a small cost, which is your buy down points, your discount points that you mm -hmm. pay to basically prepay your interest up front. So that's what I've been seeing. Not so much the rates going up like tremendously, like how it was in 2018. If you guys remember towards yeah. the end of 2018, I thought we were going back to, you know, right. 2010, yeah. 2008. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, no, it's, it's still really low. I, I would say we're still on historical lows and if anyone's out there that's ready to buy, now's the time. I mean, now's yeah. the time to buy. Now's the time to refi. It's right. it's, it's now. We don't know how long it's going to be. And like I said, if, if we had a crystal ball, <laughs> yeah. I think all of us would want one, right? <laughs> well, one thing I can say is that because of all this Prop 19 and the changes in the taxes, there's going to be more and more where sellers are going to be willing to carry. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Seller financing is going to be... Uh, a thing that we're going to be dealing with and which is good. Yeah, it could be a good thing. And we just need for, um, you know, the, the actual lenders to open up and allow it, you know, mm -hmm. because of the whole, you know, total LTV, the, the total loan to value, mm -hmm. you know, so if the, if the owner's going to carry or gift a down payment, you know, we have to word it properly and all yeah. that stuff. But yeah, it's definitely going to start loosening up. More programs are going to come out. You know, more DSR, DSCR loans are going to be more aggressive. You know, you know, construction loans are going to start coming out. You know, so it's 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 getting there. It's it's going to. Yeah, Peter, I want to I want to know more about that after the show. Sure, no <laughs> problem. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's gonna be a long, a longer story. So that will be yeah, <laughs> that can be a show in that. itself. <laughs> All right, All Peter. Right. If we have any viewers that do want to get pre-approved, how can they get a hold of you? Um, I can actually give you my information, or you could share it with them. However way you guys want to do it, you know. Or they, through Facebook. Yeah, I'm on yeah, Facebook. I have a Facebook. On Facebook. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel. I could we could post our email and you know however ways you want. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, do you guys have any other topics, ladies? Not right now. Maybe next <laughs> episode. Maybe we yeah, can have Peter episode, on again. <laughs> I think. I mean, Peter, you have been amazing. Thank you so much for being on our show today. You've answered a ton of questions. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, it is still the market to buy. It is still a great time to buy. Yeah. But we're. We're still seeing, I'm seeing a ton of buyers still buying. It is, it is still a good market. So, yeah. And, and if I may, if I may give an extra nugget to the buyers, cause a lot of them have told me, you know what, Peter, I'm going to wait till the market crashes because they're going back to 2008. I want to mm -hmm. make it clear that that was mortgage fraud that happened in 2008. That was a bank issue that happened, and those today don't exist. That's different, right? Okay, so it's a way different market. If you are if you were to compare apples to apples, because a lot of the, especially millennials, they were kids, and they saw the trauma that their parents went through in 2008 during the foreclosure era. Um, today's market is nowhere near that because everything mostly is full docs, and they're yeah. all performing. So for, for a crash to happen like it did in 08, that is going to crash the whole entire America if it was to happen today. 
Mm -hmm. You see, so needless to say, I don't see that happening. But if they're waiting for like a correction of fifty, sixty thousand dollars, remember if it's supply and demand. So if if the housing market goes down, the rates will go up. Yep. So your tipple topple on the fifty, sixty thousand dollar delta between today's market and if you were to wait with the interest rate shifting to the other direction, you're gonna end up paying more monthly payments. Mm -hmm. And I and I actually have illustration on that because I'm a numbers guy. I like to like put everything on paper because I always say math doesn't lie. So, you know, when I put two and two together, you can actually see a pretty big savings between the two. So, mm -hmm. and then not only that, your tax deduction is, you know, your mortgage interest is your tax deduction. So right. it could be beneficial for you, you know, so mm -hmm. just wanted to say that. Mm -hmm. That was that was huge. That was actually very important. I think a lot of uh, that's something the three of us always talk about is how some people, a lot of people, will come up to us and they're going to say, "Hey, we're just we're going to wait till the market crashes, and the, the market's not going to crash." But it's, we'll save that for another episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All righty then. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, we will see you hopefully in another episode. And mm -hmm. for everyone watching, um, we will see you next time. Have a good night. Always sweet chest. Bye. PMS or PMS. Yeah, for sure.